not saying I do, but normally I'm good at that I may open the bike up a little bit, just kind of, you know, not for long, but just for a little bit, you know. This day, I couldn't do that because there was someone in front of me. Somebody, the, the only way I could put it is they were yard sailing. So they were looking for yard sales. They were going slow and kind of just really in no hurry. So I sat behind them. I was in no hurry either. You know, we're always at church and we're late anyway. So, you know. <laughs> I mean, normally we just play Nina, so. <laughs> so we're going along and, and finally the lady puts her signal to turn into a driveway at the right hand side. And I'm like, oh, finally. So I drop out of the pass and she changed her mind. She wanted to go to the other side. Oh, she wanted to go to the front oh. side. And it happened so fast, it, it, it was just, there was almost no reaction. All I remember is flying by her window and doing, hi. <laughs> <laughs> but that day would be a game changer because God had to shake me. He needed me to sit quietly for the first time, and I'm not a person that sits very well. I, I like to move, and I, I don't like having to rely on too many things. But that day, when we went to the hospital, I knew there was something definitely wrong. So they take their x-rays and they come back and they say, well, you've, you have a broken rib. I'm like, oh, that's, that's too bad, I'll, you know, I'll deal with that. And I go home and we get home and all of a sudden I have this, this wave of nausea come over me and I have to lay down on the mud on the floor if anyone's been in my place you know what that is. So I'm laying down there and it passes and I realize that I, I can't get on the floor. I'm thinking, okay, there's something going on. So I had to literally shimmy down the stairs to somewhat turn myself and get myself up. That's the only way I could do it. So I knew there was something more going on there and I was having great pain in my shoulder. That night, everything would really fall apart pretty bad. So I went to lay down and as I laid down, something punctured and I kind of caught myself halfway down. But it was such an odd angle that I, I couldn't keep myself up and I fell and all of a sudden you heard a crack and somebody was screaming which was me, and I don't, I don't, I don't scream, okay, that's not me. Of course, Nina was freaking out. She's like, can you please sign this life insurance? <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we go back to the hospital the next day, which I promised I would go, because they wanted to send me to triage, which I, I walked out and said, no, thank you, it's fine. So the next day we go back in, and of course I'm doing protocols at home all that time. Right, I'm, I'm RPing, I'm using both machines at the same time trying to get the information out. And now they come back and say, oh, well, uh, it looks like your, uh, your fibroids are broke. I'm like, oh, that's not, that's not cool. So we go back home, I'm doing what I'm doing, I'm treating, and uh, my friend Jay, he's, he's assisting. And of course, Nina makes a, a deal with the doctor that I would come back again, not telling me that I would have a little CT. And the reason I didn't want to go CT is because I knew that if I got back in that position, whatever moved, it would go again. So I'm like, I'm not laying down again. There's no way I'm going on that table. So we go in for their little thing, and they're saying, well, do you want more medication? I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not taking any medication. I don't believe in that. Oh. So finally, we get on the CAT scan. We figure it out. It takes two big guys to kind of hold me and to go back. We, we do the CAT scan. And this was the game changer, because I knew there was more going on than what was actually occurring. So the CAT, can, the CAT scan comes back and it says, well, your whole left side is flail. And what that means is that every rib on the left side was shattered, not broken, shattered. Every rib is shattered in pieces, okay? So I was having a horrible time breathing, as you can imagine, but I was still doing what I had to do. Because I realized the consequence of not breathing to being comfortable for a pocket versus having issues long term. So I had to force myself to breathe appropriately all that time. There was no compromise on that, and it was hard. Trying to stand properly and trying to sit properly when you no longer have this pillar here, I gotta tell you, is a challenge beyond challenge, right? Now, the rest of the reports that came back was the shoulder, which I knew there was more going on in the shoulder. And the impact of the car was so severe that the shoulder itself was normally a ball. When I hit the vehicle, and thank goodness I wasn't going my regular speeds, because I probably wouldn't be here. But when I hit the car, the ball changed into an oval. And all the nerves in the shoulder were destroyed, which would explain everything that was going on. I couldn't keep my shoulder in joint, it was falling out left and right. 
I couldn't feel anything. It's like someone had an ice tray on your shoulder. So, in knowing this, we just proceeded with what we do. I moved appropriately, even though I couldn't. I treated it to repair. Eight months later, I had an assessment with the, what the neurologist, neuro, whatever they are, so quiet anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know exactly what's going on. I knew what he's going to say. They come back, they do the conductivity of the arm, of the nerves, and he basically comes back and said, well, all your, your nerves, there were five nerves in the shoulder that were destroyed with that impact of my gun. I know that. He goes, but it's really interesting because four of the five have started to regrow. I'm like, I also know that. Because <laughs> that's God's hand. That's the tools he had given me. So that was my test to take me deeper into a system that I had gone I'd have to say complacent at the time. I was comfortable where I was. But I needed to go deeper in order to understand different things in order, in order to help other people here. So you can thank me later. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but the things that God was showing me in that period of time, when I actually stopped attacking the cage, because at that time when the accident happened, you like having a wolf in a cage, I kept attacking the cage. I wanted out of the cage. I didn't like where it was. I wanted it. I want to move. I don't want limitations. I don't want this. How am I going to teach people how to heal themselves when I'm broken apart in pieces? This was what was on my mind, being attacked by the brain. And that's when the word, when I finally stopped attacking the cage and sat, when I finally tired myself out, which might have been, I don't know, three years ago. <laughs> and I sat quietly, and I finally started to hear God speaking. And he started showing me how the physical and the spiritual, they are connected. They're so connected, it's not funny. If you try to destroy the flesh, you could destroy the flesh. But how are you gonna how are you gonna do the work you have? Right? So what it comes down to is what we have to do is we have to control the flesh. That garden that we're talking about, it has to be dressed, which means it needs we need to be controlled the garden. The only way we can control this garden is by doing those four simple steps. You have to learn to breathe appropriately again. There's no way around that. That's the first step that has to happen. And probably, honestly, if anyone that's ever came to me. It's probably the hardest step, right? Sitting appropriately, yes, that's challenging. Standing from a sitting position, yes, that's challenging. Standing appropriately, yes, that's challenging. Walking, the breathing is the hardest thing you're going to learn again because it's going to take everything you have to learn how to do that because those old patterns, those compensations are so powerful. You may do it properly for 10 minutes and before you know it, you're going back to this again. Oh, no. Every time you're challenged, you go back to what's comfortable. And then we shut everything off again, right? So here's, here's a nasty little tidbit of information. If you were to stand appropriately, and all of a sudden you start talking to somebody, and you, you know, you do that little shift, right? Or you kind of go to the one hip. Mm -hmm. All it takes is three minutes. Three minutes to shut that back off. Three minutes. You may spend an hour Training that in three minutes to reset it. Okay? So when you're sitting and you're thinking about crossing your legs or putting a foot behind you or you're standing and you want to get more comfortable, it's almost like a baby crying, right? That's your, your nervous system trying to get you to move out of position, go back to something more comfortable. And that's not the way it works with us. Our bodies, they need to be challenged because if, if things aren't challenged, there's no reason for change, right? Any history in the Bible, any story that you'll read in the Bible, whenever there was great things that happened, first tribulation hit. The tribulation created a change that had to happen. You agree, Terry? So in other words, when we go to treatments and people have come for treatments because like 80, she had the issue with the IT bin. 80 had to have, first of all, the courage to do what she had to do because when we find those areas, they're not nice. Right? These are areas that have been not communicating for a long, long time. So normally what we do is we, we look for an area that has a 10 out of 10. In other words, it's an area that you put it on, the person slaps you, you're like, wow, that's good, we got it. Right? So they're, they're intense. But what happens is whenever the person is moving, they're breaking up those areas, and they're actually creating communication again. And all of a sudden, there's no more pain because they're moving the way they're supposed to move. But the hard part is not creating movements, not creating circulation, it's not getting rid of the scar tissue. 
to eliminate the compensations they've created over years. That's a hard task, right? Because they may, may move appropriately during that period of time they're with me, but as soon as they're on their own, they stop thinking, right? And that's why if, if we really look at the human, and we look at the human body, how it actually is, there's actually five components to the human body. There's the physical, which we know. There's the spiritual, which we know. But there's also an intellectual side, which we don't see very often. There's also a psychological side, and there's an emotional side. These are the five components that make us very unique, how God created us. You could say that the intellectual, the emotional, the psychological, well, it really is, if you wrap it up nice and tight, it's the soul, mm -hmm. right? That's what makes us unique, it's our soul. Now the soul, 90% of the time, always navigates towards the flesh, unless it has a reason not to. You agree, Terry? Yes. It's just, it's, it's almost like it's, it's gravity, right? We're just, we're pulled to the flesh. So we need to dress and to keep the garden. If we don't do that, we lose control. We no longer have control, which means that spirit of God which is in us never has a chance to mature. We can't. Right. right? This temple is God's temple. Amen. But if we don't use it properly, if we avoid doing the things that we have to do, at this time, well, I, I don't have any issues with breathing. At this time, I don't have any pain when I sit. And we just kind of avoid all the things that we're hearing right now. Eventually, will come a time where they are issues. And it may be a time where there is no correction. Because if someone's damage done, there's nothing you can do but medication, which does not fix anything, by the way. So then, I was shown the seed sower's parable, which I don't have. Have that? Okay. So, the seed sower's parable, it talks about the farmer sowing the seeds onto wayward ground. And then sowing the seeds onto the stony ground and the thorny ground into good ground. And the way I look at it is the, the wayward ground is simply this. What's going to happen is, let's say there's 60 people here. There's going to be a part of the people that are going to be motivated and inspired to, to make change. But what's going to happen is they're going to make those steps forward. And something's going to happen, life's going to happen actually, it's going to distract them. And even though they had their bag at the door ready to make that change, it's going to stay at the door. And it just stops. That thought, that tension doesn't go anywhere. Then we look at the, the stony ground, which means it's, it's really shallow ground. So there are people that's going to hear this information and it's, it's going to conflict with what they've heard previously from someone else. Some other system, man's system, it conflicts with because it's totally contrary to what man does. So they're going to not really take it serious. How important is breathing? Well, it can't be that important. I'm still alive. Well, how important is it to stand appropriately lined up for these structures that are actually lined up? Well, I've been doing it wrong all along, and there's really no issue. So it doesn't go anywhere. And then the thorny ground is simply this. is the people that actually want to make the change, but there's so much damage done already. They would have to get off the medications. They would have to be, they would have to have the courage to actually move forward. And it's pretty hard. They're pretty afraid. The medical world has made them pretty, pretty afraid to move forward without them. And of course, we have the, the good ground. I would say most of us have a lot of thorns regardless, even though it's good ground that we have to take care of. And Doug said something interestingly. He said he was listening to, uh, I think it was a minister in Israel or something like that. And he said that a farmer would never waste his time on thorny ground or rocky ground. He would only go to the, to the good ground. And that was interesting because I thought to myself, the first part of my career, I spent working with the stony and the thorny ground. And what would happen is the people really, they had no interest in learning. They wanted to be entertained, which is what we see in the systems nowadays, right? They don't want to really get anything out of it. They want to be entertained for an hour. So it's an adult daycare. That's really what the training, the training grounds are. We see the you know, different fitness classes going on. This is man's world, right? There is no long-term change that's going to happen from those classes other than keeping you distracted for a short period of time. So this is the commercialization of our bodies. There's three Ds of that. There's distraction, deception, and the very end is destruction. So all these activities, they don't move our bodies properly. They're not, they're not made to do that. They're made to buy you time. You may, and we see this all the time, 
people can lose weight. We've seen people get stronger. We've seen people get faster. So.